So for yeah. today's Blind Ambition podcast, talking about Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Meta, and what does it have in common? Rick, what is going on with the compensation? That's what everyone wants to know. What's happening with the pay, with the stock, with the bonuses, with, with the base salary? I understand you have a survey, and the survey says? Things aren't looking good at these big tech companies, right? So, you know, anyone who's probably listening to this podcast kind of knows a lot of the total compensation, the pay packages at these large companies, the Googles, the Amazons, even some of these high-flying startups like Rex or Stripe, a lot of them are based in stock. And so you, you might be seeing as much as 40, 50, even 60% of your pay packages uh, based around this stock-based component, right? Whether you're getting these so-called restricted stock units uh, you know, which after you're at a company for a certain amount of time, you just get these grants that vest or or hit your kind of E-Trade or Fidelity account or your Schwab account. Um, and in many cases at like Google or Facebook, you can buy these stocks in the public market so that they're just as good as cash. And because of how those companies' stocks are doing and trading in the public markets, um, you know, a lot of them are are at lows, especially compared to one or even two years ago during the pandemic. Uh, and, and so what we're seeing is a lot of these software engineers, these tech professionals, they're seeing their pay packages go down as a result because you know the expected value has since dropped because the, the company's share prices have dropped. Um, so the base isn't dropping, but... The, the stock, the value of the stock is going down. So they're all in, you know, compensation is declining. That, that's exactly. But it's on paper though, right? In a way it's on paper because it could turn around again. It could also turn around. That's true. But I mean, for a lot of these professionals, especially if you're at an Amazon or a Google or a Meta, um, these companies' shares are, are traded in the public markets you might be getting them vested monthly after your first year of employment. And so a lot of these tech professionals, for better or for worse, have started to treat this almost as like a guaranteed income, less of a bonus, but kind of, oh, this is just as good as cash because I can sell it out on the open market right when I vest in, in those shares. Uh, and, and so some of these people, they're saying like, oh gosh, well, if I set up my payment uh, plan to automatically sell these sh restricted stock units upon vest each month, that portion of my paycheck is getting lower and lower because, you know, the shares uh, might be trading lower and lower each month uh, because of the volatility of our economy, the volatility of the technology industry. Um, Yes, there's some companies that, you know, are, are seeing shares go up, but it, it's not to the extent that a lot of these tech professionals um, have come to expect or have seen previously. Well, Rick, let, let me let me kind of kind of figure this out. So let's right. say Meta, because what we've noticed, because we've talked about this a little bit, where there's a trend that started, it seems to be kind of subsiding now, but for a while, every time a company would say we're laying off, we're going to lay off 5,000, 10,000, the, the, the price of the stock spikes. And then they'll, you know, Meta announced buybacks, if I recall correctly, and then right. stock price goes up. So if let's say you're a Meta shareholder, are you maybe in a better spot than Amazon that I don't think they had the same thing? So is it, and I don't know this for, you know, for sure. So I'm asking, is it like, it depends on the kind of company that you're dealing with that some, maybe if you're a meta shareholder, that could be okay. Google, I'd imagine now, even if it went down with Bard, they seems to be, they seem to be killing it. All of a sudden GPT chat, that was a thing. Bard seems on fire. I use it all the time. So maybe for people who are listening and watching this, it, it could be temporary, right? I mean, it could be, depends on the company. It could be long-term and you skunk, or you just got to tough it out and ride it out and hold 
like what they say, like, like with, with, with the crypto and Bitcoin, you just be holders, right? And just hold on, hodlers, whatever it is, just hold on and wait it out. What do you, what do you think? No, so that's exactly right. So technically, right? So the shares do trade every single day, um, you know, when the markets are open. And so when you do vest, it could be higher than the month previous. Uh, but generally what we've seen is a lot of these tech professionals, um, they get a certain number of restricted share units based on a um, certain value. So let's say you started at Meta a year ago and in your job offer, we're gonna pay you $200,000 base salary and, you know, I'm making this up, but um, $400,000 uh, over four years. And so you could expect, you know, every single year to get about $100,000 in shares. Um, what might have happened and what is happening to uh, quite a few professionals out there is um, the number uh, at, at which their job offer has given them, that share price has since dropped. And, and so they're they're getting kind of fewer because let's say, you know, I, and this isn't Meta's share price, but I'm using round numbers, but using my $100,000 example, let's say shares were trading at $100 at that time when you got that offer. So you could expect a um, thousand shares uh, every single year. And now let's say the stock price has dropped 20, 30%. Well, you're still getting that hundred shares. But now you see that the, the share price has dropped 20%. And so what you were expecting $100,000 of value or what was, you know, quote unquote, promised to you in your job offer is 100,000 each year because of the share price, you might be getting 80, 75,000. And so you're seeing kind of, you know, a, a potentially a, a big drop in your pay when it's actually kind of realized or hits your bank account. So what do we do? So like, if you're, if you're working at one of these companies, do you have any suggestions? Do you write it through? Do you, is there a way also to hedge it? You know, so if you have RSUs or you have something else to maybe do some other financial engineering to offset it or no? No, very good yeah. questions. Um, I mean, in terms of hedging, a lot of these companies um, what they will do is as part of their kind of employee handbook or kind of um, employee policy around their stock-based compensation around their pay packages is they tell employees that they cannot trade in any derivatives. So they can't technically hedge through kind of like, um, hmm. you know, buying these so-called option trades where you're betting on the direction of the stock in the future, right? A, a call option where you expect it to increase after um, or or even you know a, a put where it's the exact opposite where you expect that the trades uh, the shares are going to trade lower um, they, they prohibit you from uh, purchasing those kind of derivatives and a lot of these uh, public companies they also have these trading blackouts right so uh, you, you can't necessarily sell your shares uh, immediately or, or at a given time, because uh, you you might be prohibited from doing so by your by your company's uh, policies or trading policies. Can you try to negotiate for like refreshers or something like that to compensate for it, or do you have to be like a top A plus, you know, ten x, you know, you know, software engineer to get that thing? And if you're a regular low performer or whatever, you're not gonna they're gonna say no. Yeah, so generally, there's been some companies that have been really proactive. So I, I during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there were companies such as um, Snap and Robinhood, Roku, they were being proactive and saying, hey, you know, we've noticed that a, a, a lot of our employees are kind of underwater on these um, stock that, that they've been given on their job offer. So we're actually going to be proactive and kind of top them up and kind of give folks a bit more stock to kind of try to make up for that difference. Um, other tech companies have said, oh, well, you know, those are the breaks. It also affects me too as a executive or as a manager, as an HR person. Um, you know, e e stock can go up, stock can go down, stocks are naturally volatile. Um, 
other companies have taken the approach of saying, oh, yes, if you are a high performer or if you've reached a certain kind of number of tenure, you know, whether it's your second or your third year, or, you know, if you're the top 10, 20, 30 percent of the, the company in terms of your performance review, uh, they will give you these refreshers, these additional grants of stock. Um, but again, it's the same problem where you're granted new stock with a certain vesting. And, you know, if your company's share price continues to fall, you might continue to kind of see this problem over and over again, where the expected value just isn't there because of the volatility of the economy, your company, the industry, and the job market. All right, we got to get some good news. So what do you do? Like, what do you do? Do you just switch jobs? Like, what's, what's the game plan? Like, do you try to maybe just get a promotion to get more money, you know what I mean, to get a higher salary? What's, what's the game that pe like people who are listening to now to say, all right, how do I make up for it? Or do I just suck it up? Like, what's, what's the deal? Yeah, so I, I mean, a lot of, there's, there's kind of three prevailing schools of thought out there that, that we, we see on blind. The first is one, you know, treat stock-based compensation as a lottery ticket, right? Rather than expecting it to be guaranteed income uh, and expecting that exact dollar amount, treat it as kind of a lottery ticket. It could be higher, but it could also be lower. Um, and in that note, you know, if you wouldn't use cash to buy shares in your company on your own independently in your kind of Robin Hood or, or Schwab account, your taxable brokerage account, then perhaps you want to get into the habit of automatically selling your stock when it's vested and just getting that cash. There's a second school of thought where there are some startups and some larger public Wait, can, can, can I just interject for one yeah, second? Yeah, please. You're familiar, are you, you're familiar with dollar cost averaging, right? Or, right, yes. So what, is that something you could do too? So let's say you really believe in your company, your company's mission and everything. And just because of where we are at this moment in time, where the stock might not be performing as we would like, that you could do dollar cost averaging and buy, are you allowed to do this? To buy, if you're a company ABC, to buy shares in the stock every month at a certain price. Sometimes you get a good, uh, you know, a higher price, sometimes a lower, but maybe that'll even out, you know, your RSUs and everything else. Is that, if, if you have the money, if you have the ability to do that, is that something? Yeah, if you have the money and if you have the conviction, many of these uh, public tech companies uh, they have employee stock purchase plans where you can, on a scheduled basis, um, you know, opt in to have some of your paycheck taken out. It's almost kind of like a 401k contribution right. um, and, and, and get put into buying your, your company's shares. And some employee uh, stock purchase plans, they have this extra incentive of kind of giving you a discount. So it might be 5%, 10% discount. So you're almost kind of like baking in a small return, right? Because, you know, if a share is currently trading for $100 and your company's uh, ESP employee stock purchase program has a 5% discount, you're buying that $100 share for, for $95 uh, and your dollar cost averaging over time, you can kind of compound and see those like little uh, kind of slices or, or pieces of percent really add up over time if you're if you have that conviction if you have that kind of iron stomach so what happens so like at these companies like you're at apple you're at google microsoft or brex or what have you do they does it hr or are there people there who like explain it because i can imagine you're a tech person right you you know or a marketing person a project a project manager a product manager like you don't know you know <laughs> you don't know wall street you don't know trading so do you, internally do they offer like you know what to do and how to do it or are you left just yeah it's up to you copy at mTOR like what is it yeah and admittedly some companies are better than others yeah so we've seen some companies like i know notion is one of them where they believe financial wellness is part of your employee package and so they actually have you sit down with a financial advisor, that's a resource that's available to these employees that will explain to them, you know, Notion's not a public company yet. So they'll actually sit down and explain to you how stock options work, how your 
you know, job offer, how that kind of stock based portion of your pay package works because the shares aren't liquid yet. Um, and, you know, there are some kind of tax consequences or, you know, tax strategy that might be involved in terms of planning. And, and so they'll actually like sit down with you and that's one of the benefits. Then there are other companies like Google where, you know, you have access to these financial advisors that can kind of do similar coaching with you one-on-one. -on -one. But I, I would say for the most part, a lot of tech professionals, they simply don't know about, you know, how stock-based compensation works, how the restricted stock units kind of necessarily like change over time, especially if you're at a public company. And so some of these folks, they, they are surprised when, you know, you know, May's paycheck is lighter than April's when they're selling the restricted stock units automatically uh, because the share prices have gone down. You know, we see those posts on blind often saying, hey, can someone help me figure out my RSU package? Or, um, you know, are people changing the kind of how you're keeping the shares? Are you selling them uh, immediately when they vest? Are you deciding to kind of hold on for dear life like the Bitcoin folks? Um, and so we see that kind of discussion happen and kind of this education that has to be self-taught rather than something that, you know, your HR team or your manager shares with you. Do, are there out there, <laughs> excuse me, are there out there financial advisors who specialize in this area? Because I, if I was in that spot, you know what happens? Your emotions get a hold of you. And sometimes you need a third party who's a little bit more objective about it. Does that exist? So like the people who are watching, listening to this, and they feel like I'm glazing over. I like coding. Uh, when you start numbers, like stock numbers, I don't care. I, what? I lose track. Could they then just seek out people who like, that's their whole job to explain it. So this way, because it seems to me like a lot of people, I don't want to say get ripped off, but a lot of people just by omission could leave a lot on the table, make bad mistakes or not just navigate. And we're talking about significant amounts of money for these people, right? So. No, that, that's exactly right. And, you know, I, I'm going to get a little personal, but yeah. I, I learned some of this the hard way where at a previous startup, I didn't advocate for myself. I didn't know about refreshers. And so, you know, I was had a quite long tenure at this startup. Uh, I was getting promoted, uh, but I never asked for more stock uh, to top off my initial grant mm. or to, you know, top up to my new level, uh, job level um, after a promotion. And so I left a lot of stock on the table and that company eventually had a high profile multi-billion dollar exit oh, so, no. you know uh, and oh, I was no. one of the earliest employees so my stock options I could have bought them for maybe like you know 10 cents or so and so you know like my, do I my, even my, want to ask you like what it would I'm not giving it as I don't want to know I don't want you to feel bad I, no, I, 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 I can laugh at it yeah. now because it, it's one of those things where looking back you think like oh gosh you know truly at, at, at 22 at 23 I had no idea about these things. Yeah. It was new to tech and, and a lot of these kind of stock options and, and stock-based compensation. You know, previously, uh, they were more common for executives, right? And so uh, when you're an executive, your, your pay tends to be a bit higher. You tend to be older. You tend to have these, you know, dedicated tax professionals or financial advisors yeah. that are already helping you. Whereas, you know, a 22-year-old that started in, PR making, you know, $40,000 a year certainly had no idea. <laughs> do, you, do you think some companies purposely don't talk about it too much because then it poof, right? It goes away. I mean, if you don't do anything, <laughs> right? It just, I mean, I imagine there's a timeline wherever if you don't, you, you don't use it, you lose it, right? So yeah, I mean, I, I, I've certainly had, you know, at that same workplace, some colleagues that um, they couldn't afford to, to purchase the stock options because it would incur um, tax liabilities of like tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so they had to walk away from buying the, those stock options to make it stock uh, because they couldn't afford the tax. And, 
um, you know, they didn't know about, there's some companies we, we had equity be on the, on the show right. and, and they do exactly this where they'll actually loan you the money so you can pay the taxes so you can buy the stock options and, and realize those gains. Uh, but, I, but I also had friends and colleagues that, you know, like me, uh, had the same situation where they didn't get those refreshers, they didn't advocate for themselves. Then there were others that simply couldn't afford to, to buy the stock options or pay the resulting tax. Um, and then there were other folks that um, just weren't aware of kind of the, the planning involved, you know, not being able to take advantage of the kind of long-term capital gains treatment. So they were getting, you know, screwed on the tax end there too. So uh, these are kind of common pitfalls that, that happen to a lot of startup and, and, and tech employees. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't say the companies are doing it on purpose, but, you know, they're not going out of their way like a, a, a Notion would right. or, or even a Google uh, to, to help their employees understand this, this uh, crucial part of their pay. So now, Greg, if, if somebody's at the point where, you know what, I just got to get out of here and they want to move, how is the market right now? Because last I saw, so what, like 190,000 tech people are laid off in 2023. And is it hard? Is it possible? Is like, what's, what's the market look like? Can you get a raise? Can you, are you going to take a cut? How does this work? Yeah, I mean, so it, it's, it's certainly an odd time out there, right? Because I, I think if you look at the news headlines, you're certainly seeing some industries being affected more than others, right? So tech is one of the top uh, industries that seems to have kind of a high profile layoff every single day or every single week. The second seems to be financial services and banking. Uh, and then the third from the data that we're seeing on blind is actually healthcare and biotech where a lot of these companies, they assume that the pandemic would be longer or maybe these companies shifted to different technologies like mRNA, or maybe their you know, stage two, stage three trials uh, didn't get approved by the FDA. And so they can't secure more funding and they have to you know, cancel a whole treatment line or business unit and lay off those folks. Uh, so we're seeing these heavy impacts in these three industries. Uh, zooming in on the tech industry, um, tech professionals really believe that it's a bad market out there. You know, we, we did a survey in April of more than 7,000 U.S. professionals in the tech industry, and nearly half, about 45% of professionals said they were willing to take a pay cut because of how bad the job market was. And, and so, I mean, there's an extra caveat, you know this, Jack, um, a blind survey, we're asking some of the most highly compensated, some of the most ambitious tech professionals out there that, you know, they were among the job switchers in 2020, 2021, in the so-called great resignation to see these pay increases. And now in 2023, they're saying, you know what, I actually don't expect a big uh, pay raise. I'm willing to accept the same amount or even less than what I currently make in my previous role. So Dude, that's kind that, of a big eye opener. That is crazy. So from like the first time you and I started speaking, that one of the reasons why I, I was so excited to like do a podcast because I love the honesty and transparency of the people are on the platform. Because I'm I grew up in a place where you, you honest, you know, straightforward, transforward, you know, and not that you like sometimes like you have radical candor, like at, at Bridgewater, where you know you could be just kind of a jerk about it. Right. But but I, I like how it's open. And it really struck me like people were very open about their comp which is fine. I respect that. That's great. You know, some people might be, oh, that's very, oh, that's so gauche. You're talking about your money. But like, they were all about like, here's my comp, you know, should I go to Apple? Cause I'm going to get 800,000 or should I go to Microsoft? I'm getting this or whatever, do the startup. And there's such like, uh, such hubris, right? Like, you know, just like, oh man, this is never going to end. And it's crazy. Cause now it's going to the other side. I said, well, you know, all right, I'll take a cut. I'll leave a little on the table. What am I going to do? What 
wow, what a change. That's crazy. I mean, yes, but I would also have the caveat out there. So we surveyed 50,000 active job seekers. These are software engineers that signed up with our Talent by Blind talent marketplace that connects you with a, a recruiter that matches you with job interviews at some of these top companies. And so these are software engineers. They're among the highest in demand. They're among the most well-paid. So, you know, in the first quarter of 2020, we ask any, any job seeker who signs up a recruiters, their first question is, what is your minimum salary expectation, mm-hmm. right? And so these software engineers at the beginning of 2022, when the layoffs haven't hit yet, they were saying minimum salary, not including the, the stock. I, I want to see 235000 on average, right? So it's quite high across all levels, across all cities even. So you can imagine 235000 uh, in kind of a middle America, would you could live quite extravagant. And how many years right? experience do you have for like 235000 about? So this was across all levels of experience. Okay. So this was like even entry level folks with two or fewer years of experience, they had some very aggressive minimum salary requirements at the beginning of 2022. And now you're seeing it decrease just about 5% on average. So right now at the beginning of 2023, so exactly one year from that period, um, the average has dropped to less than 230,000 minimum salary. And, And so there's kind of this expectation of, oh, well, you know, in order to get a role out there or in order to stand out as a candidate, I actually have to kind of lower my my salary. It's also a recognition that some employers' pay packages have dropped lately because of that stock component, right? Where, um, you know, pay packages just generally or overall have started to drop because there's kind of a supply glut with all these layoffs, certainly towards the end of 2022. And beginning of 2023 do they is there a trade-off where let's say i'm a software engineer is making 235 plus you know bonus plus rsus and all that kind of stuff and for whatever reason i want to move i'll say all right i'll take 220 you know 215 220 but could i negotiate and say okay i'll take a hit from my base what i was paying i'll take that hit but to compensate i'll take the risk And can I get more stock because I believe in the company? And so would that offset, you know, the, the, you know, taking less on the base, does that work or is that how people play it out or no, it's just, it's just, it's too standardized. It's just like a take it or leave it package. No, I mean, that's a good kind of counterpoint and good negotiation tactic, Jack, that you mentioned. Uh, Because there are certainly companies out there that are willing to negotiate on this, right? So there are some companies, especially startups, that are a bit more cash starved. They still need to hire these kind of crucial development, engineering, technical roles. Uh, And they're willing to negotiate if you come to them and say, hey, you know what? I, I believe in the company. I'm willing to stay around a little longer, right? Uh, and, and to recognize a higher stock grant if you're going to give it to me, right? Uh, because, you know, a, very common in the tech industry, a lot of these like quoted stock um, based compensation or your pay package, they usually vest three years, four years, five years to, for you to realize the entire uh, portion of that stock. All right. All right. You and me here because I'm thinking this out loud, right? So let's say I'm a young guy, right? Unfortunately, I'm not. I'm an old guy. But let's say I'm a young guy. I'm 23, 24, 25, right? And I've been getting a couple hundred, you know, let's say, I'll be modest, 200,000 a year plus all the other stuff, right? Right. And then there's a cool startup to say, hmm, maybe instead of being in big tech, and like you mentioned just before, Rick, like they're cash starving these startups saying, hmm, I can go there and maybe say, hey, I'll take, let's say 200, whatever, right? But here's what I want in terms of equity and then get a chunk. And that that's when you mentioned earlier in the in, in, in a conversation, the lottery ticket, where if it hits, boom, you know what I mean? Like you own a big chunk of it. You're, you're a rock star. You got it made. You got generational wealth. 
Is that is that a play? Especially if you and the reason I'm saying young because this way you don't have a mortgage. You really maybe you don't have kids. You don't have all those in conferences, so you could right. roll the dice a little bit when you're 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. You know, is that a strategy right. for people like you know I'm blind and and other places too to say hey. Maybe let me let me go for it, man. If I go with this really cool startup, presuming that you did your homework and it's solid and the and the VC firm behind it is is re reputable, you know, and all that kind of stuff, that you could end up being freaking rich, like crazy rich. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned it because that's kind of you know earlier I mentioned there's kind of three prevailing yeah. schools of thought out there. This is the second school of thought where. Um, some professionals, you know, if you if your lifestyle right now doesn't necessarily need as much cash, you know, if you've kind of budgeted yourself well, where maybe you're locked into a lease, um, you know, your expenses aren't going to change much day to day, um, and you can kind of budget around. Uh, some people are doing exactly that, where they're kind of taking a bet on themselves. They're taking a bet on the company. They're also taking a bet on the economy that'll improve. Yeah. Um, you know, in the next, you know, few years and saying, you know what, I'm at a place where give me more stock, right? Like I, I'm willing to set less, less cash uh, in order to have that kind of potential future payout later. Um, alternatively, and this is kind of the third school of thought that I was mentioning earlier, is there's also folks that are the exact opposite, where they will say, you know what, I'm willing to like give up some of my stock in order to have kind of hard cash in hand right now i could see that there's, there's some companies out there like Brax and shopify they'll let employees tinker with how much of their pay package is stock oriented or cash oriented because alternatively you might be thinking oh gosh well i have a mortgage and i need to make sure that you know Maybe I have an adjustable rate mortgage and my, my interest yeah. rate might go up that I don't get surprised by the bank there. Or, you know, maybe you're about to have a kid and uh, you just need to have more expenses in your life that need to be paid. Uh, and so there's some folks that are, you know, playing with those levers there. And, and that's certainly a, an option out there. That makes so much sense because if, if, you know, and I've seen people on the site where, hey, I bought a house in San Francisco, or I was planning to buy a house in San Francisco, or I relocated in 2020 during the pandemic. Now I got to come back. And they're kind of strapped for cash. And as you pointed out, you have a kid, maybe you have another kid on the way, you know, now you have to pay five, six percent, seven, whatever mortgage. Now, yeah. And it starts adding up and like the stress kind of builds up. So it's like, less stressful to say, I know I get the 250 base, whatever the stock is, whatever. I know I can meet my nut. I'm okay. <laughs> and then I'll just ride it out. Let's see how this all plays out. Now I could end up a year later kicking myself because if I took the stock, I'd be wealthy, but this is how life is. You don't know you're gambling. Or you could say, you know what? The peace of mind is way better. You know what I mean? Just, just knowing I got that money. I got my salary. So I, it sounds like a lot of it's it's how your temperament is and how your position. You know, are you a bit you know are you a bit of a player and you want to roll the dice? Are you conservative? Where are you in your lifestyle? So it's not like one step you know fits all. Right. I, I mean, all investments carry risk, yeah. right? And there are certainly some professionals out there. Uh, they have this valid point of, gosh, well, if I work somewhere a lot of my personal wealth or my personal income is tied up into one company, right? I not only depend on, let's say, Google or Meta for my salary and my pay, but I'm also getting their stock, you know, if they, yeah. something goes wrong and they have a layoff, not only am I out of a job, you know, I lose the stock, I lose the cash, like I'm really kind of screwed there. Um, you know, there, there is a chance of kind of, diversifying and saying, oh, maybe you'll give me more cash and um, I can use it to, you know, fund my lifestyle and where I am personally. But alternatively, maybe you can take some of that portion and invest it yourself, right? Maybe in a uncorrelated industry, right? Or maybe in kind of a, a, a different asset, right? Maybe you wouldn't, um, you know, spend that cash 
that you have personally buying your employer shares, and, and that's okay. Um, and, and so for a lot of those folks, you know, going back to earlier, uh, you know, some folks, they, they shy away from like holding on, you know, and saying like, oh, well, my, my Amazon shares are down 10% right now. Um, I, I'm going to keep it because eventually it'll go up later, mm. right? And, and they just end up holding and holding and there's a possibility that, that it could go down further in value. Um, and, and that ends up being a question of, oh, well, taking a step back, if I didn't work at Amazon, would I spend that same amount of money buying that, sh- those, that same amount of shares in the open market? Maybe or maybe not. And if you want it, maybe you're, the right idea then is to sell or, or take less stock and more cash and then use that cash that you would spend uh, elsewhere. I think that's super smart. Right. I think that's a really smart strategy. And I'll give a disclosure. If you don't mind, I'll include you too. Rick and I are not financial advisors. No. Don't don't base your investment decisions on two knuckleheaded podcasters. You have to get <laughs> your own financial yeah. advisor. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to be on that Twitter yeah. handle, TikTok investors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as a as a weirdo giving advice. Yeah, but it does. I like what you just said because it makes sense. Because if if you're getting your salary from the company and you're getting all the stock from the company, and something goes wrong, God forbid. You're just screwed. But if you take a portion and just like, as you mentioned, you know, non-correlated assets, whatever it may be, or even it's just dividend stocks, you know what I mean? <laughs> even if it's just whatever it might be, you know, maybe bonds, muni bonds, just to diversify it a little bit, that that's, you know, it, it, it evens out. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, or it could just, uh, maybe you want a dollar cost average yeah. and something else. So is there anything else from the survey that, that I didn't ask you about? I, I think one thing that's really interesting is kind of the extent that people in the tech industry perceive how poor the job market is, right? So, you know, earlier I mentioned that 45% figure that said, oh, I'm willing to take a pay cut because of how bad the job yeah. market is. You know, when we asked them about other reasons, these tech professionals, they cited things like, you know, I, I really care about a company's culture right? Maybe I come from a bigger company and I just didn't like it because of the performance review standards or how bureaucratic it was or the types of things my team worked on, or maybe there just weren't avenues of career growth. Then there's, you know, we also asked them about return to office. Uh, We also asked folks like, oh, are, are you willing to accept a lower job just because you need a new company to sponsor a work visa for you mm-hmm. to stay in this country, right? Because that might yeah. explain why some people are willing to accept a lower pay. Um, the job market reason was more than the number of job seekers who picked company culture, return to office, or work visa combined. So that's how bad folks really think the tech job market is right now. Um, And and so that's kind of the standout statistic that I I think, one, software engineers are willing to accept lower amounts of pay now. And two, they really think the job market is bad. Um, And and so my advice to kind of the employers and the executives and the HR people that are listening to this podcast right now is, you know, I, I don't want the takeaway to say, hey, great, you can lowball candidates right now, because that's certainly not what we're saying. But it, it's it's really to focus on, you know, when you are speaking with a candidate and they're in your final stages and you're about to get to the job offer, there are actually these different levers that you can pull, right? You can actually ask these job seekers, okay, well, this is the typical standard offer that we would give someone at your level or your uh, level of experience in your discipline or your job function? Do you want more cash or do you want more stock? You know, some professionals are willing to negotiate on that and they might be more willing to accept your offer even if your, you know, total compensation pay package comes in less than other folks if you're able to provide that flexibility. Similarly, if you're able to provide that flexibility and that adaptability with kind of, in office work schedules or the flexibility for remote work or, you know, providing kind of a very clear career growth, career level uh, for 
advancement. Those are all things that software engineers, tech professionals in particular, are quite excited about because, you know, they might not have seen those uh, avenues or, or, or those kind of preferences uh, realized in their previous roles. You're so right. If I could just build on it too, it's like, I think if you're going to interview beforehand, you want to have a good sense of your priorities, as Rick was mentioning, and what's the most important to you. It could be, you know, you moved out of San Francisco to go to the suburbs and you don't want to start schlepping back in. So remote work is, is like a non-negotiable. So, okay, it's remote work. And then the same thing with everything else, like the corporate culture, the kind of company, the base, the bonus. So before you go, a lot of times people go into the interviews and then when it comes to negotiations, they're just not prepared because they don't, they just think salary, you know, right. like, like that's the mindset salary, but on the tech side, because there are the RSUs and stock grants and all these others, but that's kind of somewhat ephemeral. It's like you you're, you're get focused on like, what's my level is my stock, but they, as you were pointing out, you want to make sure you, you know, you get a holistic, you know, package that's catered to what's good for you. You know, so it could be remote work. It could be, as you mentioned earlier, I just want the salary. I just want that, you know, comfort level or, hey, I'm willing to take a risk. So this way, when you negotiate, you can't negotiate well if you don't know what you want. So you have to really know what you want, really what's important. And, you, and, it's, and it's, it makes us even write it down like, okay, here's my top thing. This is like a non-negotiable. Here's something, you know what I mean, which I can negotiate. Here's, you know, like, ah, I'm, I'm open. So this way, when you go in, you could be really confident because you know what you want. And then it's better for the person, whether you're an HR person, the talent acquisition person, whomever, you know, hiring manager, it makes their life easier too, because now it's not a guessing game because they know what you really want and what's important to you. And they could say, hey, we can do it or we can't, or how's, here's how we could play around. Jack, I mean, I, I want to pose a question to you yeah. because, you know, you've been recruiting high-level industries, yeah. high-level people for decades, and this job market right now is quite unique. Have you noticed that the time to hire is getting longer? Because I, I think it would be really interesting, a, yes. a good advice point to say, you know, my anecdotal experience is you know, companies are kind of sitting on their heels or they're throwing in more hoops through having you meet more people. The, the, the interview or the time to, you know, get your butt in the seat is just taking longer. You know, if you're have these preferences and you're sharing them up front, maybe you could save yourself some time, you know, instead of waiting until the very end and then saying, gosh, I, I wasted two, three, four months or even longer. I don't know if you if you've heard of longer, um, only to find out. Oh, they're they're actually. Uh, I have to be in the office every single day, and I don't live in New York. I'm in San Francisco. It just doesn't work. That's um, such a good point. You know, so so smart. Such a good point because what happens is this: you're absolutely 100 percent right. A lot of times you go uh, into the interview and you, you're not thinking of these things, and so by the time you get an offer, there's a disconnect. So you thought you were going to get, you know, X. And then they give you half X or a quarter of X. And like, you're like, I just went through 10 rounds of interviews over six months and you lowball me and you're pissed off. And you're like, what the heck is this? So right at the beginning, if you, let's say you're dealing with a recruiter, you want your recruiter to make sure that they know what you really want in terms of compensation and whatever you want. Here's a little, you know, check. you don't want to just say what you want. You want to put more than what you want. So let's say just make mm. round numbers. Let's say you want $100,000. You don't say I want 100,000. You want to say I want 120,000. Because you say 120,000, they're going to say, "Huh. Jack really wants 110." <laughs> so so you still get more than what you want, but you give a room for negotiations. You have a little room to put in there. So you always want to give you ask for more, but you don't want to be that guy or that woman who asks for like ridiculous it's like you know, you go into a car show. Four hundred. Yeah, yeah. It's like you don't want to be like as a you know, you know, a Ferrari, and you're like, man, I don't want to pay two hundred thousand. I'll give you seventy thousand. Like, no, come on, this is stupid. You want to be realistic. You want to have it where it's realistic enough to know that you're not trying to play games, but they're so they're gonna take you seriously. So you want to find that out. Then, and I think Rick, I'm so glad you brought it up because for a lot of people, this to me, this is one of the most important things that you need to know. 
when you're interviewing, especially because for the last 10 plus years, for most people interview for white collar professionals, whether it's in tech, whether it's investment banking, you, you know, across the board, it's been pretty good. And, you know, they would go through the whole process relatively quickly. Lately, it is so slow. It, it, it's, it just drags and drags and they throw more people in that you have to meet with. Um, and it goes on forever. And it's very easy to have your self-esteem and your self-confidence eroded because you start thinking it's me. And then you don't really want to tell and talk to your friends and family about it because you, 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 you feel like, am I the loser? Like, what's wrong with me? So you keep it to yourself and you feel worse. Don't feel that way. It's, this is what's happening. And I'll tell you why. And I'll be you know, really you know, straightforward. The reasons are this. Is we are having a banking crisis, which no one knows how these things are going to play out. We have this, you know, the Democrats and Republicans just can't agree to anything. It's a pain. Like, God forbid, they try to meet in the middle and do something. So they're worried about the debt ceiling. We're worried about the dollar being devalued. We're worried about being dragged into a World War III because of what's going on in the Ukraine. We have record high, 40-year record high levels of inflation. The Fed has been jacking up interest rates. The cost of everything is higher. There's, there's, everybody seems to be angry in this weird vibe. So it makes sense if Rick and I were like, and, and people here listening, if picture yourselves, if you were on the board of directors or you're in a C-suite, let's be frank, with that, what's going on, it would be more reasonable to say, let's just slow walk the process. Let's only hire if it's absolutely positively, you have to do it. And if not, what happens, and you may not realize this, guys, what happens is that not only they slow walk it, they're just kind of building up a pipeline for the future. So they may not even have any intention of hiring. So if you don't get that offer and you're like, what just happened? It could have been, you, it could have been they didn't even want to offer it to begin with. They just wanted to build up, get a you know, database of people that, are, that if and when things get better, they're ready to go. So don't so don't take it personally. Don't feel it's you. Don't feel you did something wrong. Don't feel that your boss or former boss is sabotaging you. It's a very different market. Now, you can go and get a job and, and you interview once or twice and you're hired and you got everything you want. You say, Jack, you're an ass. You don't know what you're talking about. That's fine. I would be happy if that happens. God bless. That's great that happened. But I'd rather <laughs> prepare you for the other side. Where you know what I mean? It'll take a long time. They're, yeah, they're they're taking the wait and see approach. Yeah. Just yeah. putting you know fish lines out there to see if they can get a big one. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Being opportunistic and not being too serious about yeah. it. Gosh, it, it, what a crazy market out there. It, it, it's it's happened. It happened during the financial crisis. It happened after nine eleven. You have little pockets of different you know upheavals throughout the time. So as long as like twenty five years, I've been seeing it. It's 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 like a pendulum. It swings one way wow. crazy, then one way back the other way, and then between it's. Um, and when things look bad, it looks like it's never going to get better. When things are good, you feel it's never going to get bad. It's always going to go up. the The psyche, the psychology of it is so crazy because we're human. So it's like. You know, oh my God, doom, it's all over. Or, hey, it's never going to end. This is one big party. So you just got to have, you got to have that, like, what I'll, I'll tell you as a recruiter, because you get highs and lows. You know, I could place somebody and I'll get a $50,000 fee. I cannot place that person. I get nothing for all my hard work. So you're right. really gambling. So what you try to do is keep a level head. You just try not to get too high or not too lows. So if you go to an interview and it's not working, don't start getting depressed. Don't feel it's you. Don't. This is what happens. It's all part of the game. And if you're, and you also don't want to get too high because you get too high, then you're also like, oh, I'm going to get this job. I'm going to get. Oh my god! And it doesn't happen. Boom! You crash. And that. So you right. just want to keep as best as you can. And trust me, I'm saying it. It's easier said than done. But you want to keep that midline. So you just you don't get yourself too worked up. You don't get yourself too depressed. And you just just keep going and just keep going and you keep going. And it's a, and at the end of the day, it's also a numbers game. If you send out enough resumes, interview with enough people, network with enough people to get you know introductions, eventually it's going to happen. Maybe you're lucky. Some people are the right place, right time, and they get it right away. Others it takes longer. But if you're focused and you're motivated, it'll happen. It'll happen. It's just a matter of when. I think that last part is a good reminder, right? Because 
I, I think it's very easy to get caught up in all the headlines and all like the craziness that's out there. But I think if you just start on those like good first principles, right? What you're looking for, what you won't ever be willing to kind of negotiate on, right? Like I need X, Y, Z in my next role. And just being adamant about that, uh, you you know, even doing that and identifying those things that um, are really important to you are one step closer for you to finding that that perfect role, right? And it, it's kind of just a, a keep trucking and, and, and keep going thing that I, I think um, a lot of people need to realize that, oh, that like perseverance is, is kind of half the battle. Absolutely. If you don't mind my asking, if anybody ever has questions or they're not sure of something, feel free to hit me up. You, you'll see me on Twitter. You'll see me on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, I think my emails are all over the place because when I post things, I'm not shy to put my phone number. I, I like talking to people. Too. So if you find yourself, you're not sure what to do and you just want a third party to bounce it off and you need a sounding board, you know, you don't want to tell you, you don't want to talk to your friends, family, because you don't want them to know how much you're making or not. Feel free to reach out because I, I didn't, like Rick mentioned, I've been doing this 25 years. I enjoy doing it. I love helping people. And especially during these tough times, you know, people need help. They need guidance, you know, and it's it is sometimes really helpful to have an objective third party that doesn't have any skin in the game to be like, hey, here's, here's you know, what would I suggest? That's a very generous offer, Jack. Thank you for that. And, you know, if you are a tech professional, Blind, we have a talent marketplace called Talent by Blind. For experienced tech professionals, we connect job seekers with dedicated recruiters who work to match you for free with multiple interview requests and job offers at in-demand employers. Uh, so that's certainly a resource that's out there for you at talentbyblind.com. Thanks so much for listening to the show. Everybody. Thanks.